Thank you very much, gentlemen. Great cast on the day. I am joined by Team Liquids Lorlo after their win over Echo Fox. A fantastic win at that. I do have to ask you, though, it seemed like the bird was the word in the second game. You guys couldn't get by it. What was the communication like for Liquid to right the wrongs there and come back in game three? Um, I think after second game, we were all like pretty tilted, but we just like regrouped and made sure we didn't like tilt off the face of the, uh, face of the earth and just regrouped, refocused, and just had a good draft for game three and just played it out. It seemed like the draft synergized very well. I got to ask you, coming out with the Shen in the top, what was it, 5-0, 12 or something, that game as well, strong in game number one and three. What has changed about your play? Because you're a different player from spring to now. It seems like there's a lot more confidence behind that. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of my play, I've been like getting way more confident in my own play and also just like having the synergy with Dardock, it's always easy to make plays around the map. So in terms of me transitioning to more of a carry player as well, it's, it's more comfortable for me. So yeah, it's just like transitioning myself from one role to the other for the team is also a really good thing for us. Well, I'm sure the fans are happy, and it's also been fantastic for, fantastic for anybody to see the flash plays and all the hard work you've been putting in the top lane. Final question, TSM and Cloud9 come in the following weeks, but there's energy, other teams in their trap games. How is Liquid going to approach the following and rest of the summer split? Um, I think we still have like tons of things to work on. Like even this series was like really shaky for us, and we weren't happy with the mortal set yesterday, even though we took a game off them. So in terms of like going into the next week and just uh, future weeks, we're just gonna look to polish up our two v one, polish up our yeah, just macro game in general, and just look to go strong into the playoffs. Lorlo, thank you very much once again. Great games, and now we're gonna throw it over to the analyst desk to break down the rest of the day. Thank you very much, Riv. Team Liquid getting the victory here, two one over Echo Fox. It was hard fought, definitely. Uh, it's interesting just because we have this discussion about them being a top three team and then occasionally we do see them plagued by mistakes that definitely separate them from the likes of Immortals and TSM as a squad. I think the big thing in this series was just like the game two draft was really bad and you don't see other teams having that bad of a draft. There's like maybe a miss pick here or two that doesn't quite work the way we wanted but like they, this series actually game one and three was pretty decisive in my mind. It, right. was, it wasn't super close. It was game two where it was just like what was that? And, and you can't afford to have that when you start playing against these top teams because you might the other games aren't going to be that close. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that statement or that point is echoed by what Lorlo just said. He's like, we you know we still even within this series uh, against the the last place LCS team had many things that we could work on. So as a squad, of course, they also recognize that there's many improvements to be made. Uh, but when you are making mistakes against the bottom tier team, that's yeah. definitely where you need to, okay, we got to clean that up first before we can even shoot for the stars on uh, TSM or Immortals. Well, I think a lot of it comes down to not the simplicity of the issue. Obviously, they do have a lot to work on. I trust Lurlo's word on that because a lot of the things that happened in this game were spiraled by Echo Fox's lack of proactivity, mm -hmm. misposition, not really trying anything, getting caught out of position, which makes a map a lot easier to be played when they're just kind of handing you the opportunities left, right, and center. Whereas you play against a top team, Natalia is going to try to influence the map. The dual lane isn't going to get, you know, present themselves everywhere. It's just please dive me, please kill me. Right. I think when you look at this draft, both teams kind of have an obvious, like, we're going to play this way style. Right. We, they, uh, game two, we said they should pick the Hecarim with the Shen to give him a dive buddy. They switch out the Victor and Karma as well. But basically, Team Liquid's comp is like, we're going to destroy your bot lane over and over if you leave them exposed. Yes. And they execute on their game plan. When you look at Fox, it's, we should try and snowball our Gnar. We should get Talia going up there, maybe three men die, sack our bot lane a little bit. And we didn't really see see that many like trades of kills where both people are using globals to different places or something or anything really like that. It seemed like one team executed the game plan and one couldn't. Well, we didn't even see any kills for a, a solid portion of the game, right? right? And I think that's what's kind of frustrating when you see Talia picked in the mid lane. And earlier today, we had two very clear examples of a Talia owning the lane phase, affecting the side lanes, creating fights, you know, changing terrain, for, you know, forcing bad decisions. That didn't happen here. And that speaks back to your point of in action from Echo Fox, you have this champion that excels when you are proactive with it. Well, I then think that didn't take place. Again, we've we talked about the issues with Echo Fox. It's got to be that confidence, the fact that they're the players just aren't trusting each other to, to say, hey, if I put resources on you, can I trust you to win the game for me? And that's just not happening here. Right. They won the second game because mainly from the draft, the fact that the liquid composition just couldn't really do anything against a singular Anivia pick. But if Echo Fox isn't willing to even try and put trust in one of their teammates, and their progress is going to stagnate, and that's what's happened for all these weeks. Yeah, very much so. Let's take a look at some of the fights that took place throughout this game, 15-30 into the game. Team Liquid picks up three for one. Up to this point, there had only been one kill in the game, so it was slow moving, at least for the early stages, but Team Liquid going to snag themselves a solid advantage here. Right, I think the thing to look at is, like, 
the Fox bot lane's a little pushed up in the long lane, so Team Liquid makes a very forced bot lane dive, not even really dive, just play on it. If you looked mid lane just prior to this, uh, Froggen had pushed in uh, Phoenix all the way into his turret and was trying to like harass him under turret rather than swinging top and trying to make a play. And I think that's the big difference in these teams that you need to look for. Like here, they're able to, to start collapsing, but if this fight started a lot earlier, it's not a three for one, it's it's a two for two, or maybe even a three for one for their favor. But they're, instead of taking that pressure that Froggen had and moving around the map, he, he looks more like he's harassing. And that's the big difference. When Bjergsen had the pressure, he was topside making that Rumble's life hell. Yeah. You didn't see that for like Shen was not pressured not the same well. Did Ray. Yeah, yeah I didn't know I want to be at Ray at all. That looked like the most miserable top lane experience of your life. But uh, yeah, exactly that, right? And so here we have Team Liquid finally finding their advantage 15-30 into the game. And they are a team that can for the most part, smartly play out a lead if they have one, right? So against the top team, sometimes they struggle securing that lead, but here they've got the lead. They're going to continue putting the pressure on 24 minutes into the game, two for O plus a Baron. That's all they're going to need to seal the deal. Yeah, this is a situation where Fox has pushed up all the way into the turret against this kind of global comp. You can't really afford to sit in front of a turret when they have so much chase down with the Hecarim and the Sivir. So this is, is just hovering around the lane too long, especially when the Gnar hasn't pushed in yet either. They can't afford to just push in one lane at a time. And they get chased down here. Great cue from Matt to slow down Kez, picking up the kill, which basically makes the Baron free. Yeah, very much so. No contest here. No chance of a steal like we've seen a couple times throughout this weekend. Well, the thing is, a composition like the one that Team Liquid is running is one that requires a certain level of macro understanding when you play against it to be able to effectively counter it. This composition can be countered simply by macro play. One of the easiest things to do is just never lane. So you always just lane swap when you put the dual lane constantly versus the top lane so that the Shen can't influence the dual lane, which is what they're trying to do. So if you never give them that opportunity, it never happens. But that requires a constant flow of communication between every single member of the team, understanding what the lane assignment is, what the warding, the cooldowns, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And I thought that it was really smart from Team Liquid to pick something that you know that Fox is not going to have the macro answer to. Yeah, that's that's uh, I love that point. I'm so glad you brought that up. And I just want to expand on that now, kind of across all teams, the idea idea that you know there are different levels of execution that are required by any team composition that you craft in League of Legends, right? You could choose the Leona. This is not a composition that would ever be crafted in competitive That's play. How you yeah, start. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, but this is obvious, right? So right. you have a Leona as a support. You've got an Annie in the mid lane. You've got a Malphite in the top lane. Like, it's very obvious that this team just wants to group. Die, we'll dive you under a turret, doesn't matter. We have tons of AoE damage and lots of go buttons, right? So that's how they, that's a very binary, you know, team composition then you have things like what echo fox crafted here and as you just mentioned this is less about the actual execution or landing of a couple of different abilities in combo with each other this is more about now how we operate around the map as a team and play it strategically and if your team doesn't excel in that area i would never suggest that you craft that kind of composition team liquid rightly understanding that okay if we just pick something that does have a very uh direct approach to winning this game Fox is not going to be able to keep us split or running around the map they Which the way they want. Which ties into the previous series, actually, of CLGP1, of CLG being unable to respond to a macro uh, champion like TF that you have to respond in the macro sense. So it very much applies to pretty much every single team. And I'd like to see more understanding of that concept from the lower level teams. We'll see if they can and can grasp that by the end of the split. Player of the game going to Lorlo here, as we heard him interviewed just moments ago. 5, 0, and 12 on that Shen, 85% kill participation. So definitely uh, picking his game up here in game three. It's a better feeling getting a scoreline like that than getting a bunch of kills. So yeah. when you're playing a tank and you don't die... Always the best. Right, especially given the comp he was against. You think that he would be a heavy focus given the counter pick of the Gnar versus him yeah. as well as having the Talia to come in with global pressure. The fact that he doesn't die in a game where he's probably the most susceptible person in his team is, is extremely impressive. Yep, so Team Liquid once again picking up the victory here in 2-1. Both of our second series of the day ending in 2-1. But that just makes that middle pack all that much more interesting, especially with the CLG victory as well. With the week at a close, let's see how, or rather, which players took home the most player of the game honors. Huni, Huhi, KFO, and Pyrian are the heroes of the, of the week, each earning two Player of the Game awards, with 11 other players walking away with one additional mention. 
Now let's take a peek at how those awards have influenced the leaderboard. TSM's Dane in the mid lane. Bjergsen is on top of the heat with eight awards followed by teammate Doublelift and Immortals members Huni and Poe Belter with seven. And of course, we've got a slew of Team I mean, Liquid players to follow. It's got to be in the colors because there's a very obvious color palette going on <laughs> there. The, blue and the blues green. and the seafoam greens. Yeah. Uh, anything yeah, ocean, water related. Huhi, number one for CLG for player of the game. So everyone else kind of has like one or two there. And then mm -hmm. Huhi's by himself. And I've never been on a team with those colors. Yeah, what, you just yellow? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> now okay, that buddy. that's out of the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, no, no, I, uh, I, that is an interesting point. It's, I think it's even more intriguing the fact that players like Poe Belter and Huhi, two players that we didn't necessarily look at as playmakers in previous splits, are snagging in these Player of the Game awards. And hey, part and due because they're stepping up. And then the other aspect of it is that as meta shifts, obviously different roles become more and less important and or flashy, even if you don't want to use the word important because all roles are integral to a team comp. It's certain ones are going to thrive or or be spotlighted a bit more than others. Yeah, I think right now we can see that mid lane is one of the highlights of the draft for a lot of teams. It's either first picking the OPs or getting counter picks or in situationally strong ones like the global Talia and TF. Right, exactly. All right, well, earlier today we invited you at home to show us how you're watching the LCS on Twitter, and we got a ton of great responses, photo responses. So here are some of our favorites. First up, at Squidosaurus Rex sends an adorable photo with a simple message, hashtag TSM win. Starting them early there. Right there, no choice in fandom. It's never for, too young to be like. Yeah, that baby looks like it's <laughs> pretty excited. It's yelling or yawning it's or yawning. Maybe or the game is asking for food. Know, is, it, is it excited? Well, TSM dominates the way they do. Maybe you do get bored watching. Uh, watching. Do you get bored watching your team win that? Much? As a Patriots uh, yes. fan, <laughs> as a Patriots fan, I can say sometimes you're kind of like, when's the postseason start? Like, when right. do I, when do I, I need a real competition? Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's easy. I, yeah, like from watching, <laughs> I like watching my team win, but I like watching my team win in close in in, in close games. Right? I mean, I want there to be a little bit of fear. There's a little bit of like pompous satisfaction in knowing that you don't need to worry at all. But <laughs> in terms of day to day, hour to hour, I wish those games were a little closer. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, next up, Chase and Walls is working hard, but still had the time to share this photo. And that's some serious dedication. As soon as it pops up, we're going to see it. Boom. There it is. Um, we've got... I can't imagine watching League of Legends and oh, operating a sharp blade is the smartest of ideas, but I do respect the commitment well, to competitive I'm, League of Legends. He can clearly multitask. Well, so. I mean, yeah, I mean, the cuts are pretty good, right? I'm, so. I'm more concerned about the tomato juice near the phone. Like, I trust this guy with the knife and all that, <laughs> but, like, the, the sanitation maybe, right. the whole just getting your phone messy. No like, water damage, please. Yeah, I know. I don't if know you're a juice. good enough cook, you can cut it without the juice going everywhere. Are you a good cook, Crumbs? Sure. I feel sure. 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 Yeah. That's yeah. the yeah. answer I, I want. Make food my that chef you won't to like. Yeah. I will. <laughs> yeah. I, I can uh, heat up a bag of chicken. <laughs> okay. Right. Next up, Courtney Zam is cheering on Phoenix One with a guest tweeting, "Watching LCS with my corgi. She's rooting oh. for a P1 win." Well, unfortunately, that one didn't come through, but they did put up a big fight. Corgis are adorable. There's no denying that. Is this after? Because that corgi looks particularly sad. He's looking no, he like, like a very big. He's, like, he's, like, right he's like, I can't look. I can't look. No, they're in champ select. For yeah, yeah. Game. I think that's oh, yeah, game yeah, one. Right. That's game one champ select. Is it? I, I don't yeah, know I think it's it game is. one. It's I'm not going to invest Yeah, you can see this, 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 this blurb it's is game. clearly... That's the NAR. That's the NAR. <laughs> it's been NAR right. all three games. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, Braum, right. Braum Rex. I'm going to move us on to our oh, last yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Now. Fi one. Finally, at Wellington CP is one of our international partners bringing the LCS to a French-speaking audience. And they've got a cool setup we wanted to share. So this is actually uh, in part the control room that is broadcasting the North American LCS out to our French-speaking audience. So a uh, good little insight on how they operate. That's O Gaming uh, would be the uh, organization. But fun little setup there. Riv and uh, Azale, I believe, off on the right screen. Good to see those I'm guys. I'm surprised you know that's Azale. Looks like a ghost. And you white. need to get your eyes checked. You can't see the channel select. You can't. It's Azale. Uh, yeah. Too close. It's just pixels. <laughs> right. I just see a million. Oh, it's Riv and Kobe. So ah. I actually was wrong. Uh, yeah. As I yeah, also was, just kicked something yeah, off the desk. We are, we are falling apart here <laughs> and digressing as we do every weekend now with these three, three days of games. Let's take a look at the league standings updated with results from week six. TSM in first place has now clinched a playoff spot. Immortals are still in second place and we've got a third place tie between Cloud9 and Liquid. CLG is fifth alongside Team Envy and the bottom four teams in order, Apex, Energy, Phoenix One, and Echo Fox. Now time to look ahead to next week. We kick things off on Tuesday with the Challenger Series playoffs where Team Liquid Academy, Dream Team, 
Cloud9 Challenger and Nova meet in the semifinals to decide which two teams get a chance to fight for an LCS spot in the promotion tournament. Primetime League starts Wednesday at 5 Pacific with the second night of the Challenger Series semifinals continuing at 6. Now the EU LCS returns Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Central European. So tune in to catch G2 Esports versus Splice and Fnatic against H2K later in the day. And on Friday, we're back here in our Los Angeles studio for Immortals vs. Counterlogic Gaming, where we'll have a special viewing experience on NALCS2 with a focus on the jungle matchup. And don't forget our match of the week on Sunday, where Counterlogic Gaming retakes the stage against Cloud9. In particular, I want to zero in on both of those two matchups. So one, the Friday matchup, in which we're going to have a look at the junglers, as well as our match of the week, CLG Cloud9. As Cloud9 is stumbling a bit, CLG showed us a little bit of something today that might uh, might make this a much closer game. And of course, they're all together racing for that third spot. I think uh, for the C9 CLG game, I think that's definitely really interesting to watch for me because C, uh, C9 has really been struggling against the top half teams. And this is really the first time that they're going to play one that's not TSM, TL, <laughs> Immortals. So right. this is like the proving ground where if you lose this one, you're really starting to drop. Whereas before it was kind of like, okay, maybe you're... Still excusable. Yeah, it's like you're very close to the TL. Like that one's debatable. And then the other two are obviously the S tier, as we call them. But if they drop this one to CLG, that's both a massive boon for CLG and a big concern for C9. And as for the CLG versus Immortals, where before today I would have been Immortals easily 2-0. Yeah. But after seeing who he at least put a pretty impressive performance on the likes of Victor and Cassiopeia, I'm starting to think that they might have a better shot. While P1 isn't the strongest opponent, they mm -hmm. definitely showcase a different style that is going to be effective against the likes of Immortal. Now, what about specifically that jungle matchup, as we are going to have that special stream on an ALCS 2, focusing specifically on that? Well, we've got Rainover, of course. We look at him, we go, okay, that's the, the jungler to beat in North America. Like Smithy, though, has been criminally underrated for a long time and has put up insane performances through the spring split and at MSI. Of course, the team is struggling as of right now. How do you expect that matchup to play well, out? Well, I think the a big thing that's impacting the jungle right now is the lack of Kindred. We saw Kindred be an instrumental pick for so many compositions. So many junglers were just living by Kindred. And now that she's basically gone and nobody's playing her, the other champions like Graves, the Hecarim, the Gragas are really surging in popularity. Whereas Rainover has the Olaf pick that can deal fine into most of these champions. Champions. The standard Rexa is what seems to be the go-to for him, while the Elise is the Xmithy pick. But if any of these teams is willing to give up some of the heavy control mages in the mid lane, which, to be honest, now Talia is one of them too. So <laughs> right. Why are you even banning <laughs> mid lane at this point? Just let it go through and focus on something that can be more important. Mm -hmm. I think that a team that can exploit a bigger champion pool in the jungle will have massive success because champions like Hecarim and Graves are very powerful. Nice. I mean, what's very interesting to me is that the game that Immortals lost last season was to CLG, and that was a game where it was actually Smithy who basically set up Darshan. They gave Huni the Huni Rainover treatment. And I think that's something to look out for in this series where maybe we can see uh, Darshan and Smithy kind of gang up again and hopefully be able to take more than just one game this time. Well, plenty, plenty, plenty of Professional League of Legends content coming at you this whole next week starting Tuesday. So don't forget to tune in for all of it. But for now, myself, Mark, Crumbs, the casters, and the entire live broadcast crew, got to thank you for watching with us tonight and have a good one.